Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by our new shirt. It's of a Gorgosaurus. You can get it at bit.ly slash I Know Dino Store. I Know Dino Store is all lowercase. Or you can just go there and check out its awesome awesomeness. Way to sell it, Garrett. <laughs> In our 242nd episode... I forgot to say that for a few weeks. (laughs) We have a new European Triassic theropod and a few new dinosaur exhibits. And on that note, I should mention, you may have noticed our titles changed. We now have an episode list on inodino.com. So if you're wondering the episode number, you can get them from there if your podcatcher doesn't automatically show them. And the list is also a good place for checking out where our interviews are, where our best of episodes were like which numbers they are, and which Dinosaur of the Days have been covered previously. So you can go there and there's a little search in the top and it'll just search through the titles of the episodes and the description of the interview and the best of and stuff. So definitely check that out if you're interested in seeing what dinosaurs we've covered or who we've interviewed or what episodes we've done. (laughs) But back to this episode, we also have a Dinosaur of the Day Uoplocephalus which I'm surprised we hadn't done before, but we got several requests, so we're finally getting to it. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons for helping us to keep our podcast going and pay for some of the -the behind-the-scenes work that we do. And this week, we'd like to thank Scotty, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklov, Lori, Risa, Kelly, Manda, Laurasaurus, Timmy, James Pasco, Gabe, Courtney, and TRX Dinosaurs. And speaking of things that our patrons have helped us to do, we're currently planning an October road trip across Australia to visit dinosaur sites after SVP. So if you have any suggestions that aren't already on our dinosaur map, please let us know because it's hard to figure out all of the things that are in a country. <laughs> but I think we found most of them. Right now our plan is to head up to Townsville and then drive straight into the outback until we reach Iromaga, stopping at several museums along the way. And then we're going to head to Sydney via Lightning Ridge and finally through Canberra, Melbourne, and eventually Adelaide. Yep. It's going to be an epic road trip. It is. It's kind of a big S shape across the whole eastern half of the country. And we're hoping to set up a couple meetups along that route too. We'll see if we can arrange that in time. (laughs) But definitely stay tuned if you're in any of those areas and let us know if we're missing any stops. We'll probably be sending something special out to our patrons for SVP as well too. So if you want to get in on that, then go to our page, patreon.com slash I know Dino. Jumping into the news, we have our new Triassic theropod from Europe that I teased before. It was published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution and written by Marianne Zahner and Wynand Brinkman. And thanks to James for sharing it with us on Patreon. So this theropod specifically is from Switzerland and its name is Nota Tesserae Raptor, Frickensis. And Nota Tesserae Raptor comes from Nota, which means feature, and Tesserae, which is Latin for mosaic tiles. I think it's kind of like a tessellation, maybe the same root there plus raptor for predator, and they used mosaic tiles in the name because it has a mosaic of dilophosauroid and coelophysoid characteristics. I'm not really a big fan of the raptor usage, though, because it keeps coming up in all these non-dromaeosaur dinosaurs, and I think it's just really confusing. I think that was a thread on the dinosaur mailing list, too. Oh, it was? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... One of the only restrictions that the ICZN has on names is that they shouldn't be confusing. And naming a bunch of non-Dromaeosaurs raptor is one thing if you do it accidentally, like Megaraptor, but come on. Then the species name Frickensis is after Frick, Switzerland, where it was found. And that's really just a few miles south of the German border, so could have easily been a German dinosaur. Since I mentioned it's a mosaic of Dilophosaurus and Coelophysis, you might be guessing that it's from the Triassic, and Nota Tesserae Raptor is estimated to be about 210 million years old, placing it firmly in the late Triassic and making it one of the earlier known dinosaurs. Cool. Yeah, and not surprisingly, it's thought to be a predator too, because a lot of early dinosaurs were, plus both of those close relatives are also predators. They found the skull, which is full of really sharp teeth 
and it had hands that looked like they might have been good for grasping, although they're on relatively short arms, so I don't know how good they really would have been. And both the hands and skull are in really amazing shape and are super rare finds. They said, quote, 90% of the skull elements are known, which makes SMF 09-2, that's the specimen name, the most complete theropod skull from the late Triassic and early Jurassic of Europe, end quote. So being the most complete of not just the late Triassic, but also the early Jurassic, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And these skulls mean so much when we're trying to figure out behavior of dinosaurs and evolutionary patterns, because you can see such minute differences even in the dentition or say if it looks like their eyes or their brain endocast is developing a certain way. It's just, it's great to have stuff like this. In addition to some really great hands and skull, they found most of the torso, and by that I mean all of the ribs, the hips, and the vertebrae in between. They also found both fully articulated arms and a couple of vertebrae from the base of the neck and the base of the tail. So it's a pretty good find. A lot of times Triassic finds are pretty incomplete, especially things that are from Europe, but this one's in pretty great shape. Unfortunately, they didn't find any leg or foot bones, which can also be really helpful, especially in these early dinosaurs, but I'm happy with the skull. <laughs> you can tell a lot from the skull. You can. And Sabrina, you'll be happy about this. They also found gut contents. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Specifically, what they found was the upper jaw of a Clevosaurus, and I had to look that up. So a quick Erictodromius burrow tangent. Clevosaurus is from a group of reptiles, which is extremely similar to the modern reptiles Tuatara that live in New Zealand and can live to over 100 years old. Wow. To me, they look a lot like iguanas or a lot of these other modern reptiles, but it's pretty amazing that they live so long. Yeah. <laughs> and also the Clevosaurus bone that's in its stomach was only a few millimeters long. So they think that this ancient Clevosaurus was smaller than the modern Tuatara group. It's pretty cool though. And that probably means that this dinosaur was very quick because being able to catch a little lizard is not an easy task. Nope. And especially considering how short its arms are, I probably had to catch it with its mouth and <laughs> no other help. I can't imagine running and trying to like grab a lizard off the ground with my mouth. Face dive. Yeah, not an easy task. The authors think that Nota tesserae raptor was still growing so the sizing estimates that I can give aren't really too relevant because usually we compare adults, but they estimate that this juvenile was around three meters or 10 feet long. At first glance, it looks a lot like a Coelophysis, especially since it doesn't have a large notch in the front of its mouth like Dilophosaurus, and it also doesn't have any head crests like Dilophosaurus, which are the two dinosaurs which we think it's most similar to. And since three meters would have been about the max size of a Coelophysis and Dilophosaurus was around seven meters long, Maybe Nota tesserae raptor would have been in between, which is kind of random speculation I'm making. But if they're all around at the same time, a lot of times different sizes is kind of how dinosaurs got their niche partitioning so they could all coexist. In their phylogenetics, it came out as a more basal neotheropod than Dilophosaurus, and it also came out as a slightly closer relative to Dilophosaurus than Coelophysis, which was surprising to me because I thought it looked more like Coelophysis. But since a phylogenetic analysis includes so much more than just the shape of the head and whether or not it has head crests, this includes things like the length of different arm bones and shapes of fingers and things like that. All of those details must add up to make it a lot more like Dilophosaurus than Coelophysis. That's why we use phylogenetic analyses with powerful computers <laughs> that can compare like 200 things at once and not just look at a skull the way I would. Another interesting thing is it was found in the same quarry as several Platiosaurus specimens, although based on what we know, it probably wouldn't have been much of a threat to a Platiosaurus unless they were very small, like maybe hatchlings or an eggs or something. That's any dinosaur though. That's a hatchling or an egg. Lots of threats. Very true. And I had to look it up because when I saw that there was a specimen named SMF, I don't think I've ever seen that one before. And since it's SMF 09-2, doesn't seem like they have a whole ton of specimens in their collection. But SMF stands for Sorier Museum Frick, or Frick Dinosaur Museum in English. And it looks pretty cool. And I didn't have it on the map, so it's on there now. It's our 176th museum that we added to the map. And they mentioned Nota Tesserae Raptor on their webpage, but there isn't any information about 
if they will display it or anything about it. Just like, hey, we found Nota Tesserae Raptor. And that's kind of it <laughs> in a very simple post. So hopefully eventually it's on display there. I guess they have a bunch of stuff about Pladiosaurus, which is from that area. So it would make sense if they put this guy in the mix. Up next, we have an update from the dinosaur color presentation that we covered in SVP 2017. And this was published in the Journal of the Royal Society Interface by Frain Beborovic and others. And it was presented by Beborovic, I hope I'm saying that right, back in 2017. And at the time, he said that he had spent over a week in a basement with dead birds. Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> that was the most memorable part of the presentation, I think, especially the way he said it. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, spent a week in a basement with dead birds. <laughs> Sounds a little depressing. It does. And creepy. So as a quick recap, they studied non-iridescent structural colors, or how I'm going to pronounce it, NISC, and just assume that you can pronounce it rather than reading out the letters, because I'm going to say it a lot. And unlike normal melanosomes, which produce pigment to absorb light, a NISC uses microscopic structures to scatter light. So it scatters certain colors up toward the viewer and then others down towards a black melanosome where they are absorbed and in that background. And so you only see the part that gets reflected by the structural part, which makes it a structural color. So unlike iridescent feathers, because these are non-iridescent structural colors, the scattering works the same for all angles in a NISC, giving the same type of effect as a typical melanosome pigment. So it doesn't change and like shimmer as you look at it by definition. The shape of the melanosome pigment background is what they studied in this paper because the scattering structure is made of keratin, which didn't preserve, but they found that that melanosome background actually had different shapes depending on what NISC color was produced. Just like a random little quirk of evolution that they could work with. Back in 2017, they said that they were about 60% sure that the feathers of Eocoraceous brachytera were blue. And Eocoraceous brachytera is a bird, which I can only find referenced in the original description. <laughs> but it's only about 40 to 50 million years old or about 20 million years after non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. So usually we don't talk about things past the end of the Mesozoic, but since this has some implications for dinosaur coloring, I think it's worth talking about. And Eocoraceous is a type of roller, which are still around today. That's a category of birds. And many of them do have a blue coloring, which is a hint towards what they found in the paper. So this new peer-reviewed study goes into a lot more detail, obviously, than the SVP presentation did. And in it, they compare their new NISC to five existing known melanosomes. They have black, brown, gray, iridescent, and penguin. I love that. Penguin. <laughs> yeah, penguins have their own unique coloration pigment. So again, the NISC melanosome shape is not completely unique it looks a lot like gray. That was the same problem that they had back in presenting in 2017. And that's why they said they were 60% sure it was blue because the shape of these melanosomes in that background layer, the gray and the blue are really close. It's really hard to tell a distinction. And that's before they're underground for 40 million years, <laughs> changing shape potentially a little bit. The big update, I think, is that this time they included phylogenetic bracketing by looking at ancestors to Eocoraceous. So basically, they try to split the difference between the probability of blue versus gray feathers. And they do that by looking at all of these modern animals that we think descended from Eocoraceous and whether they now have blue or gray feathers. So if all of the ancestors have gray feathers, then you'd figure, well, it probably was gray. And if they're all blue, then it's probably blue. And when they did that, they found that most rollers and their cousins are often blue. So they decided that Eocoraceous was probably blue when they found their blue-gray feather melanosome shape. But in addition to these blue-gray feather shapes, they also found a lot of black melanosomes on the tail fan and the neck because they sampled all over this fossil. They had tons of good preservation and all over the bird could be sampled. So they managed to test lots of different areas. And they ended up with a complete picture of what they think the dinosaur looked like when it was colored, sort of like Confucianus or one of these other early birds that we've talked about before and 
coloring them through these microscopic melanosome analyses. So in their creation, they ended up with a mostly blue bird, but the areas around its neck and its tail fan are black. So it looks pretty neat. I think it's a pretty clever idea that you could use these melanosomes that are the background layer <laughs> when the keratin doesn't preserve that is the part that's actually producing the color in order to figure out what color they were. But it is really unfortunate that we can't tell the difference between gray and blue because there's a big difference between a gray bird slash dinosaur and a blue bird slash dinosaur. So hopefully in the future we'll come up with something new to find more interesting colors in non-avian dinosaurs since we can't use phylogenetic bracketing the same way on older non-avian dinosaurs that we can on Eocoraceous and more recent extinct birds. I'm still holding out for like a pink fluffy T-Rex. Oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> Although it's seeming less and less likely all the time. Unless it ate something like shrimp, like how flamingos turn pink. Yeah. Oh, maybe we get a Spinosaurus that's pink. Ooh, that'd be fun. <laughs> One of the more aquatic dinosaurs. No idea how you'd tell. That's for the scientists to figure out. <laughs> this is just our wish list. Yeah. Next, there was a pretty cool article about paleontologist Amy Atwater, who's the woman who runs the Instagram account at Mary Anning's Revenge. And she tells Mary's story and shows specimens that she works with, Amy, every day. And Amy said that the goal of the page is to inspire girls and women to pursue their dreams. So it's a pretty cool page. In exhibit news, there's a company called Handbuilt that created a really cool augmented reality Cetacosaurus exhibit. So in it, you see a Cetacosaurus skeleton appear in an exhibit in a museum. I'm not sure which museum this was. Pretty sure it's in Australia, though, because the company is Australian. The skeleton walks around for a bit, hides under a rock, and then when it comes out of the rock, it's a fleshed out Cetacosaurus with hmm. skin and quills and everything. And it kind of hangs out and runs around in its area and makes noises. It's pretty cute. In New York, the Center for Science, Teaching, and Learning in Rockville Center has a new dinosaur exhibit, and they've got more than a dozen dinosaurs. Some of them are animatronic. You can see Camarasaurus, Stegosaurus, an Ankylosaur, Myosaur, Struthiomimus, and two T-Rex. They also have live animals, including an alligator. In Morristown, Pennsylvania, Elmwood Park Zoo has a new dinosaur exhibit that includes the 65-foot-long Brachiosaurus. The, yeah, the zoo's asking people to vote to name their new dinosaur, too. So options, I like these options. They include Dwayne the Brock or Brack Johnson, probably Brock, Becky with the long neck, Rocco Lee, <laughs> Elmer, Zachiosaurus the Brachiosaurus, and Spaghetti. I'm not sure when they'll decide on the name. <laughs> Those are some pretty fun names. Yeah. <laughs> In Boulder City, Nevada, you can see Tom Devlin's Dinosaur Adventure. So Tom is a special effects artist. He opened up his Dino Adventure back in January. And there's a short video that shows a dinosaur playground, a lot of cool dinosaur replicas, some animatronic dinosaurs, and dinosaurs you can ride. Can I ride them or is that for kids only? I think it's for kids only. Oh. There's probably a size limit. And if there's not, there's probably people who would frown at you. <laughs> I can handle that. <laughs> In Auburn, Washington, about two dozen people dressed up in inflatable T-Rex costumes and ran around the Emerald Downs track, which is usually used for horse racing. <laughs> so it's pretty funny. And it's funny to watch with the heads all bobbing up and down, the big T-Rex heads. A lot of people crossed the finish line. Didn't look like there were any photo finishes, though. And last in the news, in 2020, the film Do Raymond the Movie, Nobita's New Dinosaur, is coming out. It's the 40th film in the franchise. I'm actually unfamiliar with the franchise, but I looked it up. The first one was Nobita's Dinosaur, which came out in the 1980s. Well, the, and they've made 40 since then. That's more than one a year. Yeah, it must be very popular. The trailer was in Japanese, so it's hard for me to know what's going on, but there's two really cute dinosaurs that hatch at hmm. big. <laughs> so Doraemon is a manga series about a robotic cat named Doraemon who uh, travels back in time from the 22nd century to help a boy named Nobita Gobi. Is that the light blue cat with like a white face and tummy? It's possible. I don't remember. I mostly remember, I think it's a blue and a pink dinosaur. <laughs> you can see where my priorities are. Yes, I just looked it up. I've, I have seen that thing before, but I've never seen any of its 40 movies. Well, maybe we'll have to watch one. <laughs> At least the one with dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we want to remind you all that we have a new shirt up on our store, bit.ly slash I know dino store. I know dino store is all lowercase because bit.ly links are case sensitive in a weird twist. So 
If you want to check out our new shirt, please do. It's actually really cool. It was originally inspired by the Velociraptor that's in the original Jurassic Park movie, but from our looking at it, it looks more like a Gorgosaurus. In the death pose. Yeah, you might have seen the one we're talking about at the Royal Tyrol Museum. I think that's the one it's based on. It looks very similar to the one that's in the movie, <laughs> at least. But then we made it more realistic by giving it more T-Rex-like arms with just the two fingers. Well, we we should say T-Public did it. Yes, because we worked with their designers to make it. And then also we made the Ischium a little bit more realistic. So we think now it looks a lot like a Gorgosaurus. At least it's close to a Gorgosaurus. <laughs> and then we also have it listening to our show, much like the Parasaurolophus is. And it's kind of fun because it's listening to an iPod in a sort of fossilized <laughs> old technology kind of way. So if you want to check out that new shirt, possibly get one, or you can also get other stuff with it on it, like mugs or stickers and stuff like that, then head over to bit.ly slash inodinosaur, all lowercase. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Euoplocephalus, which was a request from Chartley via Patreon and Discord, so thanks. Euoplocephalus was an ankylosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Canada. It was about 18 feet or five and a half meters long and weighed about two and a half tons. And it was also about 7.9 feet or 2.4 meters wide. It had a wide body that was flat and a large gut and it had a wide rib cage. Eoplocephalus was quadrupedal with short, sturdy legs and it had robust forelimbs that were shorter than the hind limbs. It probably had a lot of muscles too. This is based on the fact that it had robust bones. It had a short neck and its skull was triangular in shape and wider than it is long. It was herbivorous, probably not a picky eater, and it had a drooping snout and a beak to bite off plants. This drooping snout was blunt, wide, and high. Yeah, you could imagine that it was probably eating stuff off the ground too if it had shorter front legs than hind legs, sort of aimed downward. And in its mouth, it had 19 to 24 teeth in each upper jaw. The lower jaw had 21 teeth, and it could pull its lower jaw backwards. Euoplocephalus' head and body was covered in a bony armor of osteoderms. The neck had these two bone rings called cervical half rings that protected it. Victoria Arbor and others thought that they formed a lower layer, maybe with ossified cartilage. This cervical half ring was several bony plates that were fused together in an arch-shaped block. As I mentioned, Euoplocephalus had bony armor plates with rows of oval scutes. Kenneth Carpenter described the armor in 1982, but it was based on the specimen that's now known as the holotype of Scolosaur, so it's not exactly the same for Euoplocephalus. Victoria Arbor said in 2013 that no Euoplocephalus specimen has in situ osteoderm, so the arrangement of osteoderms is unknown. The armor was made of small scutes, the diameter was less than 5 millimeters, and they may have formed bands if it was the same as Scolosaurus. Euoplocephalus may have had a sacral shield made up of four of these bands, and these bands had horizontal rows of larger, oval, flat scutes. The scutes varied in size on its body. The largest, tallest ones may have been on the shoulder, and it may have had large keeled plates on its upper arms. Old restorations depicted the club with two large spikes. This is based on a restoration of Scolosaurus by Franz Napsha. He based it on a specimen with an incomplete tail. This armor may have helped with protection and thermal regulation. Victoria Arbor and others found an intact Euoplocephalus skull in southern Alberta, and it's at the Royal Tyrol Museum for study. The armor on the skull had head tiles that fused with skull elements, and the snout looks like a mosaic kind of pattern. Euoplocephalus had two pyramid-shaped squamosal horns that grew from the back of its head, and also had a quadratal jugal horn at the lower rear of the skull and it had bones over the eyes that may have helped to protect them. Yoplocephalus had small eyes, but it had a good sense of smell, though the olfactory part of the brain wasn't that large. It had two external nostrils on each side, and very complex air passages and sinuses. In 2018, Jason Bork and others used CT scanning and computational fluid dynamics to simulate how air moved through the crazy nasal passages of Yoplocephalus and Panoplosaurus and they found that their noses could warm and cool air that it breathed in, and that helped cool down the brain. I think we covered that when they discovered that, too. Yeah, 2018, makes sense. <laughs> the nasal passages may have moistened the air that it breathes in, and these nasal passages looked kind of like crazy straws. In Euoplocephalus, these nasal passages were almost twice as long as the skull. 
The team also reconstructed blood vessels based on bony grooves and canals and found a rich blood supply running next to the nasal passage. Porter, who worked on the study, said, quote, hot blood from the body core would travel through these blood vessels and transfer their heat to the incoming air. Simultaneously, evaporation of moisture in the long nasal passages cooled the venous blood destined for the brain, end quote. So Euoplocephalus's large size was good for keeping warm, but not good for cooling off. There's a risk of overheating, especially the brain tissue. The nasal passages were looped and complex, possibly also for vocal resonance or to balance heat and water. Yeah, so the idea is that it would lose less water through breathing by having this sort of mechanism to cool off and warm up air as like a sort of radiator in its head. Pretty cool. And chylosaurs are cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So Euoplocephalus also had a large vascularized chamber at the back of the nasal tract, which may have helped improve its sense of smell. It could probably hear low frequencies. Possibly you could hear the low sounds from the nasal passages. Euoplocephalus had a heavy club-like tail. This tail was like a hammer. It's long. It had a bony club. It probably held the tail just above the ground. And it probably swung the tail low. The base of the tail was flexible and then the club was rigid. And it may have used this club tail for defense or even for combat between themselves. Euoplocephalus may have been a solitary animal. It may have made a the way cats mate. This is based on Kenneth Carpenter's book in 2000 about dinosaur reproduction. He wrote that a common method, quote, might be for the female to squat on her forelimbs, raising her rear to the air, sort of like a house cat, end quote. Hmm. There's only one species, it's Euoplocephalus tutus. Lawrence Lamb found the first fossil in August of 1897 in what is now Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, Canada. In 1902, the fossil was named the holotype of Stereocephalus tutus, It had part of the cranium and five scutes that were part of a cervical half ring. The genus name Stereocephalus means solid head, and that refers to its armor. That's a pretty good name. Yes, but it turns out that name was already used for the beetle Stereocephalus back in 1884, so the dinosaur was renamed Euoplocephalus in 1910, and that means well-armed head. The name was too good. It had already been used. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Although not that long. He only missed it by 18 years, it looks like. It was long enough. Yeah. (laughs) The species name Tutus means safely protected in Latin. In 1915, Edwin Hennig reclassified Euoplocephalus as Paleocincus, but now Paleocincus is considered to be a nomum dubium because it's only based on indeterminate ankylosaur teeth. Oh, those teeth names. Don't name things based on teeth. <laughs> well, this was a long time ago. I know. <laughs> in 1964, Oscar Kuhn referred Euoplocephalus to ankylosaurus. A lot of ankylosaur fossils were found in North America in the 1900s that were named new genera. That just goes for a lot of fossils in general found in the early 1900s in North America. But anyway, in 1971, Walter Coombs reclassified many of those as Euoplocephalus, and he synonymized Anodontosaurus, Dioplosaurus, and scolosaurus with euoplocephalus, which meant that there were now 40 specimens that were euoplocephalus and also meant that euoplocephalus spanned about 10 million years and was the best known ankylosaurid. Might be ripe for splitting if it's over 10 million years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> In 1978, Combs also renamed Tarkia as euoplocephalus giganteus. Coombs and Teresa Marianska said in 1990 that Euoplocephalus has four distinguishing traits. Premaxilla that doesn't have dermal ossifications, slit-like bony nostrils, the beak is at least as wide as the distance between the rear maxillary upper cheek and teeth rows, and there are three toes on each foot. Then in 2009, scientists found Dioplosaurus to be a valid taxon because it had triangular claws. In 2010, Victoria Arbor said that Anodontosaurus was also a valid taxon because it had a different skull and cervical ring ornamentation and had pointed triangular knob osteoderms. Paul Pankowski and William Blow said in 2013 that Scolosaurus was a valid taxon. And also in 2013, another study by Pankowski named and described Ukotokia based on fossils originally thought to be Euoplocephalus. And in 2013, Victoria Arbor said that Scolosaurus cutleri Anodontosaurus lami, Dioplosaurus acutosquamens, and Euoplocephalus tutus were all valid, and that Euoplocephalus lasted about 2 million years instead of 10. Now we're nice and split up. Yep. (laughs) 
Victoria Arbor and Phil Curry found in 2013 that Euopocephalus does not have round osteoderms at the base of the horn at the back of the head. It has sacral ribs that perpendicularly point outwards, and it has keeled osteoderms with a round or oval base, so things that make it a little different. You can see Euopocephalus at the Hall of Fossils at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. Nice. We've seen some really great pictures from patrons on our Discord of the new gallery at the Smithsonian. It looks awesome. Hopefully we can visit soon. And today's fun fact is that it took about 1 million years for animal life in the Antarctic Sea to recover after the Chicxulub impact. A million years. That's such a long time. (laughs) It is. Such a big impact. It is. Heyo, impact. Hmm. (laughs) This is according to an article in Paleontology by Rowan Whittle et al. And in it, They point out that current simulations put Antarctica as one of the least affected places on Earth from the Chicxulub impact. It's really far from Mexico where the impact happened and there was a lot of land in the way. So it kind of had to reverberate the tsunamis and things to get there. Plus, winds aren't going to carry ash to the poles as much as they do east and west. Same thing with the spherules and a lot of things like that. But apparently it didn't help all that much because according to Science Direct, In the Antarctic Sea, 60% of marine species went extinct compared with 75% globally. So yes, it was worse on average to be in other places, but still most of the things died in Antarctica. And I shouldn't even say most of the things because definitely most of the things died, but most of the species even went extinct. (laughs) So that's like all of most of the things died. Then for about 300,000 years after the Chicxulub impact, it was pretty much just burrowing clams and snails on the Antarctic seafloor. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. For comparison today, there are tons of starfish and coral on the seafloor, not to mention fish, mammals, and dinosaurs swimming in the water. I'm not sure if those would have fossilized necessarily because things that are on the seafloor itself fossilize better. So it could be a little bit of a preservation bias, but at the very least, we didn't see any of the stuff that was on the seafloor. It was just stuff in it. The authors say that there were about another 700,000 years until, quote, species richness and diversity values, end quote, reached the pre-extinction levels. So that's where we get the 1 million years to kind of get back to normal. And that's just getting back to the species richness. That's not necessarily getting back to the diversity across different types of species. That could just be there's a whole bunch of different types of clams or something. I think it's really interesting because the animals in the Antarctic seem like they should be the most resistant to the effects of a giant impactor. They mostly, in this case, live underwater, so they're not going to get affected by the giant fires or the huge gusts of air. They're in Antarctica, so the big rushing waves affected it the least. The animals there are already adapted for living in the cold and the dark, which were two of the big problems by the impactor. And they're living over 5,000 miles from the impact site where, you know, everything went crazy. But still, most of the animals went extinct. So there's really just no hiding from the screwed up carbon cycle is kind of the message here. It globally screwed up how carbon got into the atmosphere, into the ocean. It changed pH of things, which changed the entire food web everywhere. So, yep, there was no hiding from it, even in Antarctica. So my dreams of dinosaurs in Antarctica being the obvious source for repopulating the Earth Maybe that's not as obvious as we thought. They did eventually repopulate, but in the form of birds. Oh, repopulate to Antarctica, but not necessarily from Antarctica. Oh, I see. After the Cretaceous extinction. But who knows? Maybe it still was the best place out of a whole bunch of really bad options. (laughs) Especially if there was a burrowing dinosaur in Antarctica. It seems like that helped a lot. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And also consider joining our amazing growing community at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Or if you cannot join Patreon at this time, we'd love a review or if you told a friend to listen to us. Thanks again and until next time. Good day.